Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, good afternoon. Happy Friday, everybody. Uh, I know that uh, folks are still logging in, uh, so we'll, we'll get started here. Uh, Mike Murphy with, uh, with Fix Us, and I just uh, appreciate everyone taking some time out of their uh, Friday afternoon as we wrap up the week to, to join us. Um, we have a great briefing set up for, for folks today, so I'm going to be I'm going to be quick so we can get right to it here. Look, uh, I think uh, folks that are um, followers of Fix Us know our mission is to uh, engage Americans to better understand and address our divisions, our distrust, uh, dysfunction in our democracy. And so when it comes to the topic of trust right, and broader distrust in our institutions, uh, frankly, I could think of no, no one better here, uh, given the work they've done on this issue, to join us to talk about uh, the topic of trust. Uh, than the folks at, at Edelman. I'm really happy to have uh, them with us today. Uh, for those just for not familiar with them, before we get into it here, Edelman uh, is a leading global uh, communications and marketing firm that partners with many of the world's largest and emerging businesses and organizations, uh, helping them evolve, promote, and protect their brands uh, and reputations. Uh, their Edelman Trust Barometer, which you're about to hear about, is an annual study uh, that they'll talk to you about where they survey thousands of respondents around the world on the topic of trust uh, in various societal institutions, including business, governments, NGOs, uh, and the media. We're gonna hear about their latest uh, update to their trust barometer uh, here today. Before I hand it over uh, to the Edelman team to, to go through the briefing here, just a couple, of, uh, a couple of quick administrative points. First, we're recording this session, uh, so folks are aware of that. Uh, and second, we're gonna do Q&A. We really wanna do Q&A and get your uh, questions in here. Uh, I know we're all Zoom professionals by now, so you're probably aware of this, but you know, use that Q&A feature uh, at the bottom. Start using it uh, during um, uh, the folks' presentation here, and then we'll start fielding those questions uh, at the following, uh, the, following the presentation. Uh, so with that, we're going to get into a, a presentation here by the Edelman team. We have a great bipartisan team from Edelman um, joining us. Um, and the two gentlemen we have joining us, let me introduce them and then hand it over to them for the presentation. Uh, Aaron Geiderman is the chair of uh, US Public Affairs. Uh, great to have Aaron with us. And he is joined by his colleague, Sean Neary, uh, who heads up Edelman's uh, financial communications practice here in Washington, DC. Uh, and so with that, uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. I'll hand it over to you uh, for the presentation. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for having us today. Uh, just a quick overview, as, may, as was just noted, Edelman is the world's largest communications consultancy. And for more than two decades, we've been examining trust and credibility, really at the global level. And you might ask, why trust? We believe trust really defines an organization's license to operate, to really lead, and to succeed. We believe that trust is the ultimate currency in the relationship that all institutions, companies, governments, NGOs, the media, that they really build with their stakeholders. Without trust, credibility is lost and reputations can really be threatened. In short, we believe trust is critical to any organization's success. And each year, for 20 years plus, Edelman's data and intelligence team really turns the deep data that we've collected into real world insights resulting in the trust barometer. So who did we talk to for trust? For the 2021 trust barometer, we surveyed more than 33,000 respondents in 28 countries around the world. You'll see at times we segment this data here into what we call the informed public and the mass population. And this is really important to just highlight here. The informed public meet four criteria. They are between the ages of 25 and 64. They're college educated. They're in the top uh, quartile of income in their country. And they report significant consumption of business and public policy news. So that represents about 17% of the total study. The other 83%, that's the mass population sample, which is everyone minus this informed public. The data for this study was collected between mid-October and mid-November, but we added an additional slide and an additional survey in the field just post November 4th in the election. And we'll highlight that in a minute. As noted, we've been studying trust for over 21 years and the survey really has revealed in those two decades, a number of trends. In 2005, we first documented the shift in trust from authorities to peers and the rise in the belief that a person like myself is most trusted. More recently, we noted the growing inequality in trust in early 2016, which really has only worsened since then. And in 2018, we first looked at the battle for truth um, with data revealing 
deep concern about the rise of fake news and misinformation. And that trend, as you know, has only grown worse, culminating in what we now call an information back bankruptcy in this 2021 report. People today, they really don't know where or who to turn to for reliable information. This lack of quality information has driven trust to record lows, resulting in, in information bankruptcy. And it really is a major ingredient in our nation's increased polarization and divisiveness. We'll dive deeper into the global infodemic in a minute, but let's first look at the overall trust landscape. So let's dig into the numbers. Going into 2021, business is now the most trusted institution. In fact, 61% trust business globally, 48% in the United States, as noted here in this slide. But business is the only institution that is trusted. And it has increased its lead over NGOs, which it had been tied with previously. And business is more trusted than government in 18 of 27 countries that we measured. You can see this increase in trust. I mean, just look over the last six months. It's really, it's been business that has seized the high ground and proactively developed vaccines in record time and is finding new ways to work to keep the economy humming. It's business, it's not government. That said, many businesses and industry sectors are still under pressure and being tested. Year on year, while business has increased, technology and professional services has seen a six point decline in trust. Long term, the tech sector has lost nine points in trust since 2012 across 22 markets across the globe. Now think about this when, as it relates to all the pressure on Google and Facebook and other platforms around antitrust, privacy and other issues. Stay on this slide for a moment, just go back for a second. Importantly, business is now the only institution that is seen as both competent and ethical, moving up from last year, when last year business was seen as really only being competent, but not ethical. So people are increasing their trust and belief in business. In fact, business is the only institution that is seen as competent, 40 points more so than government. Aaron, if you can go to the next slide. And because people are more likely to trust things that they're familiar with and to trust local entities, trust in my employer has proven to be a real beacon of trust. Employers are trusted in all but one country with stable or rising levels of trust year over year in spite of the volatility that we're seeing in other institutions. So think about it. I mean, who are you trusting most? What our findings are saying is people are really finding trust in their employer. In fact, communications from my employer is the most trusted source of information at 61%, beating out national government, traditional media, and social media. So again, think about that. Communication from your employer. So a newsletter from your employer is more trusted around the globe than the newspaper or than media. We'll look at this slide for a moment here. At a glance, the Edelman 2021 trust parameter, which ranks countries based on their trust index, the average of the trust in the four institutions in each country, so Aaron, let's just go to the next slide, looks very similar to last year. But if you look closer, you'll see that this year's trust survey shows winners and losers with about half the countries declining in trust and the other half increasing in trust. Now, if you look very closely, I'm not sure if you can see our country, the US, um, but I'll get there in a moment, but it's, it's, it's fallen off pretty dramatically. Two of the big headlines really are centered on the US and China, the two biggest economies in the world. China lost its place at the top of the ranking with a 10 point decline. So China had been at the top of trust, but that's dropped at record numbers. Trust in the US was relatively stable in terms of changes from last year to this year, but then we did a post-election survey and we saw a dramatic five-point decline in trust from November to December. Just back up a second, please. Which would place the US or places the US near the bottom of the ranking. So if you see that, if you can see that right there on your screen, the US is number, uh, is it 48? Of, uh, and then it has dropped pretty dramatically um, to third from the bottom, only passed by Japan and Russia. That's overall trust. In the US, looking at the slide that we took post-election, trust declined even further, especially among Trump, uh, Trump voters, where we see a stunning 13-point decrease in trust overall and a double-digit trust decrease for government, media, and NGOs. Note in particular that trust in media among Trump's, Trump supporters is literally non-existent at a very low 18%, nearly 40 points lower 
than among Biden voters. And when we say Trump voters, that's not necessarily saying the Republican Party, because there are Republicans that voted for Trump, but it's saying specifically Trump voters. Now let's look at the pandemic and how really it has further inflamed fears. We all know that this has been an especially challenging year with increased fears and concerns, but it turns out that contracting COVID is not the concern that people are most worried about, if you wanna to flip to the next slide. An even greater percentage are worried about job loss, climate change, and cybersecurity. I found this most interesting. While nearly six in 10 worry about contracting COVID-19, the same number worry about losing their personal freedoms in this year of lockdowns and mandatory stay-at-home orders. You know, we see that battle almost every day. We see that divide across the country in decisions to wear masks, for example. Let's look at the next slide. These escalating fears have really created a dramatic increase in urgency in finding answers and solutions to critical societal problems. It's interesting, when asked whether certain societal problems have become more or less important since last year, improving our healthcare system has become 62 points more important along with addressing poverty, which is now 53 points more important, and improving our education system, also, also 53 points more important. Really, the most foundational building blocks of society are in desperate need of repair. Clearly, one of the main takeaways from the 2021 trust barometer is that there's a real crisis of leadership. Aaron's going to dive a little deeper into that crisis right now. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. Um, when we're looking at the kind of collapse in trust that constituencies, voters, and the informed public are having on the institutions that have historically uh, driven trust, solutions, finding solutions to urgent problems um, is increasingly uh, having uh, constituents and these audiences look to new sources or other sources of information from which to um, make decisions and build trust. They're not looking for from political leaders. What they're looking for is to other sources such as business um, in order to inform decisions and rely on information to quell fears. So when, fears. So when we look at um, the problems that are facing society, um, particularly in this past year of crisis and where leadership is failing, uh, none of the societal leaders, government officials, CEOs, journalists, or even religious leaders are trusted to do what's right. The people who are trusted uh, and those who are most familiar with their constituencies are those people who are local, right? So people in my local community, um, despite a seven point decrease since last year and my employer's CEO have all risen. Scientists are still trusted. Now this is an important point. So due to COVID-19 and, and, and the vaccines, scientists um, was, was put in there as a synonym for credentialed experts. Credentialed experts who have, who have studied and understand the issues at a granular level and have the um, background from which to inform decisions, um, particularly in the, in, in the lens of COVID um, and other areas, those credentialed experts are who people are looking for and they're, they're the most trusted. So taken together, the scientific community, people in my local community, and my employer and CEO are really looking at who, are, are who people are really looking at as the arbiters of trust and truth in this context of fake information, misinformation, and uh, the digital ecosystem and the news cycle. So everyone is beginning to think through um, from our respondents, um, am what is what I'm hearing true? Is the source that's delivering it credible? And how do I then apply it to you know my future outlook? Um, so when you break this down a little bit more, once again, post-election, we're looking at Biden voters and Trump voters. Trump voters are Trump voters, people who voted for Trump. There are a lot of Republicans baked into uh, the Biden voters. But if you look at post, our post-election supplement to the trust barometer, the dramatic differences between Biden and Trump voters, especially for journalists. But really, the important finding is what the two charts have in common. Both Trump and Biden voters trust employer CEOs, 
the only societal leader trusted by Trump voters specifically at all, um, putting employer CEOs in a critical role to reach those who feel most abandoned by other societal leaders. This is significant. And the finding is, is that, you know, the equity of business and the equity of, you know, what we do every day um, walks in and out of the building every day. And they're getting more exposure to their the leadership of where they work, uh, and the community that they engage with on a day-to-day -day basis. And they're building more trust within those communities than they are from external communities and external voices. So we really need to start thinking through, you know, if we are gonna drive change on a from a policy framework, from a business framework, from a societal framework, if we are gonna drive change, how do we best use the equity and the relationships that we have and that we've built over time um, to regain trust. So um, if this is just the bipartisan agreement that political polarization has reached a danger point in the United States. Like if you look at this ideology, the degree of, of hyper-partisanship and polarization is absolutely clear if you just look at the events of um, January 6th, right? It has gotten to the extreme. And if you look at both sides, there's almost like a mentality of, if you're not with us, you're, you're against us. And I, I, in Biden's um, uh, inaugural speech of an uncivil war, that uncivil war between the two sides is actually fueling this divide further apart rather than building bridges and compromising and leveraging diplomacy from which to find and galvanize solutions to problems. So this is a significant finding and it's something that you know, when we look at it, you can see it every day, but it's, it's good to have numbers behind it because both sides of the aisle feel that polarization is not helping America um, put a vision in place moving forward. So if we look at like societal leaders um, and how constituencies are viewing the information that's coming from them, um, there is a high level of mistrust right? The lack of trust in societal leaders today is very acute, right? It's so acute that people actually suspect both government and business leaders of deliberately misleading them or deceiving them by spreading misinformation or partisan or, or spinning language to achieve a partisan outcome. 57% agree that government leaders are purposely trying to mislead people by saying things they know are false or gross exaggerations and 56% feel the same about business leaders. This is something that um, is acute and a perceptual credibility problem that needs to be addressed. And it can only be addressed through transparency, clarity of information, clarity of purpose, and the ability to follow up uh, words with action. So Richard, I think Sean, Richard calls it action communications. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really, you've got to walk the walk and prove, um, prove out what you say um, in actions that you take moving forward. So raging infodemic fake feeds mistrust. This infodemic that we're talking about is if you look at constituents in America, they don't know whom to trust. They don't know who to believe. And so we don't know what to believe. People have lost faith uh, in the traditional markers of information, particularly in credibility. Uh, so in a fearful crisis ridden world that we're facing, not just a COVID pandemic, now the, the pandemic has, has accelerated this um, because we're looking for trusted news and information on a solution moving forward and, and constituencies are being barraged with information on all sides. Who do we trust? Um, so if we look at this infodemic, that has gotten to epidemic proportions, you know, what does that mean and how do we apply that moving forward? Um, if you just look at news organizations as seen as biased, I think all of us who, have, who work in politics, public affairs and crisis management in relation to issues, um, news organizations today are absolutely seen as biased um, by, by, by the audiences that they serve oftentimes they are viewed as affirming beliefs, not confirming the facts. So if people believe that journalists, reporters 
are also purposely trying to mislead them. How do we, how do we bridge that divide and lead in a time of crisis and rebuild trust with, with the communities that we serve? I mean, the stats on this slide are pretty, are, are pretty important. And I'll just read them to you. Nearly six in 10 say that news organizations are more concerned with supporting an ideology or a political position than they are with informing people about what is actually happening in the world. And 61% believe that the media is not doing well at being objective or nonpartisan. So, you know, we, Sean and I live in a world of, of politics and public affairs. And this is important because we need to find new pathways to deliver messages, new proxies and surrogates and spokespeople to deliver them. And oftentimes it's the employer, it's the leader of the organization who leads a, a swath of that local community and their, and their family and circles of friends through, through the day to day. So in this media landscape, and I just teed this up, the employer is, is the most believable, right? It's stunning for us that the most believable source of information um, and, uh, and communications is employer communications. So when asked what kind of communications would be believed when repeated just once or twice or even less, my employer communication scored highest at 61% across the board, higher than government communications or traditional media reports. So this is where we see employers and business are in key positions to solve problems. And now if we go back to those earlier slides where you have credentialed experts and scientists, uh, oftentimes those employers have staff, surrogates and proxies um, that work for them that are the most credible people in those communities that they serve and can deliver the messaging um, that drives um, trust forward. So what is the new mandate for business? right after all of these slides. Now there's a much longer presentation which we can um, give uh, and provide you, but amidst all of these challenges, it has never been more clear that the mandate for business is to lead, right? When government is absent or ineffective, people are expecting business to step in and fill the void. 68% agree that CEOs should absolutely step in when government doesn't fix societal problems. 66% uh, agree CEOs should take the lead on change rather than waiting on government to impose it. And 65% believe that CEOs should hold themselves accountable to the public, not just to the board of directors or stakeholders. Um, since that's the only institution, since business is the only institution that's trusted and, and, and seen to be competent, um, it is expected to play a leading role um, in addressing the challenges beyond the business itself. So the role the business plays and the organization plays in the communities they serve is absolutely essential. And it's at a point of uh, where people are expecting them to lead America out of this crisis. So like we said before, talk is not enough, right? Business has to take action before it talks if it has to be remain credible moving forward. And this is where we have another really important finding. Uh, the greatest opportunity for business to gain trust is by performing well as the guardian of information quality, ensuring that only reliable, trustworthy information is being shared and consumed. So if you look at other trust building actions uh, that are components of this, that are people looking for business to act on for the long term, embracing sustainability, focusing on long-term thinking over short-term profits in addition to delivering a robust response to COVID and driving economic prosperity. I mean, we can see it in the administration now where Biden's first priority is COVID relief, but underneath COVID relief, there's a host of other issues that need to be dealt with, including fiscal responsibility, including budgeting um, and social as well as um, economic programs, um, such as trade, um, technology and other areas. So. Uh, the agenda is challenging for the administration, um, and, and there is skepticism. Um, I mean, I think 76, 75 million people voted for Trump, and that of that, there's skepticism that any government entity, regardless of political partisanship, um, can be successful So, in building trust. So similar to the finding that business is expected to fill the void left by government, 
companies also have a significant responsibility to fill the information void when the news media is viewed to be failing to provide accurate information. A sentiment that 53% or more of respondents globally agree with. We don't have that data on that slide. So, so how do we move forward with emerging from this information bankruptcy? One, we talked about this, business has to embrace their expanded mandate. CEOs and leaders of organizations have to lead on the issues um, that are not just re related to the business directly or indirectly, but also on societal issues. Um, two, there is a sense that business not only needs to lead uh, with information clarity and truth, but also act with empathy because the uh, because you know globally our citizenry is um, dealing with something that has not occurred in our lifetimes, um, and it is critical that we're able to understand and also act. Uh, three is to really provide trustworthy content POVs and also bring to bear voices um, who are relevant within the community and hold trust and credibility. And I think the final point, which is really important, uh, and I think this is why we're here, um, is don't go it alone, right? In order to lead effectively in this environment, it's essential that business partner with government, partner with NGOs, and show that they are leading in this information and trust gap that we have uh, in America. And so with that, you know, with that, that kind of concludes our short presentation on trust and we can open it up for Q and A. Uh, Aaron, Sean, that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, thank you both so much. We do have uh, lots of questions. Uh, folks are <laughs> typing in, so we'll get to them. Um, yeah, Aaron, Aaron, if it's possible, you could probably take the screen down, I think, uh, and we'll we get to the q and I'll start. There you go. Um, Am I down? Yep, you're good. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start fielding as many questions as we can uh, in the time, and I'll field to both of you and let you all decide, obviously, how you want to uh, take them. Um, there's a couple, I'm going to go, there's a couple of just methodological questions up front, just throw out quick, and then we'll get to some others. Uh, Joe asked, how did you define quote unquote business? Is the way you kind of define business in this? <laughs> I'm not sure if it's through there, but also Susan asks, how did you decide that the informed public makes up 17% and mass population, 83% of the global population? So maybe, maybe you can explain a little bit of the, of the methodology there on the, on the global. So I can answer the latter, maybe Aaron take the former with regards to the definition of business. Sure. But, but with regards to the, so it was 33,000 people globally. Um, and then the individuals that we're interviewing, they're filling out demographic, demographic information. At the end of the day, the pool shows up, the percentages that we showed. So 17% fit into this bucket of being the informed public. And then 83% um, uh, showing up as being uh, just that mass population. Mm -hmm. There, I mean, so just to give a little additional detail on how the surveys are done. So these are online surveys um, done with individuals where they're spending 30 to 40 minutes filling out detailed questionnaires and then we're verifying that information. Mm -hmm. So 33,000 stable against the global population. Our breakout against the United States is stable against the, um, the US population. And it maps to not just the respondent base, but we also mapped it to um, you know, the definition. So educated, informed, active, votes in elections and consumes media. So there are behavioral attributes to the screener that allow us to ascertain whether this is a gen pop or more of an informed public um, with a higher affluence, higher education, et cetera. So it's a good kind of split between the two. Um, but when we look at the data from this, as well as pool it out through other client work, uh, uh, the stability holds in terms of the findings. It's a good question and one we get regularly. I think the other one on how we define business, um, business um, is an employer that, that has, I think it's 50 or more employees or 20 or more employees. And it ranges from enterprise size organizations that are global to domestic national businesses and foreign businesses within, um, within local or um, geographies. And then we have small business. So it's a good size. And when we're talking about business, of course, most of these people have jobs. 
um, that we're talking to. So the ability for us to kind of pull out the finding about business versus others um, is, is pretty significant. I hope that's helpful. Yep, that's great. One additional thing, Mike, just very quickly to note, this is the global survey, but throughout the year, we'll do um, any number of different cuts of that survey where we'll dive deeper into different sectors. Mm -hmm. So we have just for the portfolio that I work with, we have a financial services sector where we'll dive deep into that subject matter that will be coming out later this spring. Um, but many different, many different cuts that we, uh, we roll out through the year. Uh, okay, Didi asks, um, do we have any clarity on who Trump voters do trust and or how their trust has changed over the four years? So in the survey and what we're seeing from our supplement, hyperpartisanship when we talk about tr Trump voters, they're really, so there's a couple of areas of where they do trust from the survey itself. They trust the business leaders and the companies that they work in. They trust their employer and their CEOs. Now, when you look at other data sources related to, so I'm not talking about a Republican in its purest form or a Reagan Republican, Bush Republican, whatever. I'm talking about Trump voters. Trump voters believe Trump, number one, and the partisan narrative, whether it be fact-based or misinformation or spun uh, from those voices that affirm their personal values rather than confirm the facts. So when we look at um, the Trump voter, there's power within that community of going through the associations and, and, and third parties that they are members of, that there are, um, talk to their business owners, as well as um, like-minded individuals and media outlets. There's a high level of trust in like that media ecosystem that is consumed. So Fox News is very much well-trusted by, by that community, um, as well as, um, you know, the other media outlets such as, um, you know, the Hannity program, you have, I think it's OFA and a few other cable news outlets, but cable news ratings have skyrocketed with that demographic, um, whereas other news sources have plummeted. So if you look at just the news ratings, you can ascertain what the level of infotainment um, and news content is trusted by by that demographic versus the others. So it's interesting, but I do think that they're not a monolithic group of people. And I think that Trump voters often range from diehard Trump voters uh, who ascribe to like the dogma of, of, of Trump um, to voters who feel that a Republican vote is better than a Democratic vote, so party line voters. And then you kind of have these ticket splitters that, that sit within that framework who are like, maybe I'm gonna divide my ticket, I'll vote for Trump for president, but I'm gonna vote for Democrats in the House and the Senate. So we've got to unpack it more, but, but hyper-partisanship is really driving how people consume and engage with media and trust institutions. Thanks, Eric. Um, so interesting, and Carolyn, Carolyn asks, how do you explain the drop in, I guess, trust in religious leaders who's in there? So, uh, and she's asking, they would also be local and kind of known personally, is sort of the thought there. Is there, is there an explanation you guys have in mind there of how why religious leaders have dropped given that? I think we'd have to look more in the data. I think a lot, I mean, this is, a lot of this data is the US based, but it's also informed um, by international data as well. I haven't really looked at religious um, leaders deeply in terms of uh, how we operate, but the hypothesis from that question was the role that religion is playing in politics and whether or not it's fueling a partisan divide rather than bringing people together. So I think that's the, that's the hypothesis that we're trying to shape out in, re in relation to religious leaders because they do play a, a role in the community, but is that role bringing people together or further wedging them apart? Sean, I mean- I mean, I was just gonna echo that. I mean, I really see the decreased trust really having a direct contact to the increased polarization of religion in general. Okay, um, Joe asks, um, if people in my local community are most trusted, how do you feel about moving more government decision-making downward to the local and state government and away from the federal government? 
I mean, I think, I mean, that goes back to the old adage, everybody hates Congress, but they like their congressman, right? I mean, so, you know, <laughs> they, they like the local representation because they can understand that that individual, that mayor, um, that local town official, ideally it's someone that they see every day and is working for them. But, you know, as soon as they go to Washington, they never see him or they, and they, they, just, they just hate him and they think they're doing um, the wrong thing for their community. So I think that is a great idea. The more localized um, politicians can get, the better. I mean, you know, I served in the Senate, I worked in the Senate for 10 years and it's like, you know, every member knows that come Thursday, you get on that plane, you go home because you need to put in as much face time as possible in your community, in your district, in your state. And when you are home, you maximize the time. It's like, and I'm probably talking to a good number of, uh, of veterans from the Hill or the administration on this call right now, but it's, it always, I always thought it was comical that they call it recess because, you know, members, when they go home, it's not recess. They're not sitting at home with their feet up. I mean, I worked for a member that many of you might know because he's close to your organization, the Senator Ken Conrad, and, you know, he would go home to North Dakota. You know, we'd be flying all across the state. Um, you know, packing in as many meetings and as many FaceTime opportunities as possible. Uh, so again, that's just a way to highlight all politics is local and the more local that you can be seen as a politician, the greater success you'll have. Yeah, and, I, and just layering on, I mean, 2021, I mean, this is the year where every state legislator uh, is in session. And so when you look at the role the state governments are playing versus the federal government um, leading into the Biden administration, I mean, it, it is going to be a busy year at state and local because if if trust is galvanized at the local level, issue priorities are stalling at the federal level for the most part. Um, state governments are stepping in and kind of leading from leading from the front, is what I like to say. So when you when you look at all the different state legislation, we look at the agenda this year. I mean, I'm working with a major domestic client that's facing significant issues um, at the federal level but we've put all of our lead on target at the state for now. So we're active in 14 states right now on communications programming, um, media relations, grassroots, um, uh, and grass tops engagement. And we're gaining more legwork, kind of conditioning the environment prior to the federal um, government really getting its legs underneath itself. So I think that this year, particularly leading up to 2022, where we have another uh, where the House elections are. I mean, it's going to be really important that state plays a significant role. And I think people do trust state. It's a matter of what policy platforms are put for put forth and how they engage with their constituencies to engage to accomplish their mission. I'm going to combine two here um, so we can get through as many as we can. Um, more micro kind of question. Tom asks, did you ever test trust in libraries or librarians, right? Uh, and then Sally asked uh, on academics, how any view on how academics are viewed? Um, would they be considered part of the scientific community? So combine those ones there. I, I love the idea about testing libraries and librarians. We have not, um, but that, that's, a, that's, that's a good idea. Um, and, um, and the scientific title that we gave really does talk about academics and subject matter experts. And, and they are very, very trusted. I mean, so again, Aaron noted scientist was used um, as the moniker this year because of COVID. But last year, you know, academics is, is part of this pool of people and far and away academics are trusted. Yep, credentialed experts. Great. Um, so so maybe what is, what's the takeaway from that? I mean, so just to apply it to our work and our business. So when we're working with clients, and a client is looking to um, promote a message, it often helps that you um, can have that message or that research um, validated um, by an academic or teaming up with an academic or teaming up with a think tank um, or an advocacy organization because they, they dramatically increase your validity. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill asks, um... I hear neighbors criticizing political leaders, but then excusing lying and inconsistencies. Uh, what responsibilities do citizens have in regards to lowering the temperature, picking moderates, avoiding social media, et cetera? That's probably outside the scope maybe of your study there, uh, perhaps, but anything your study would suggest on sort of the role of um, individuals in sort of turning down the temperature here? 
climate? Are we are we going right into climate? No, 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 no. Turning down the temperature with the um, the partisanship of the country. Right. Oh, sorry, my <laughs> mind. That too. Goes to yeah, that too. No, no, no. <laughs> so I mean, I get, again, this is not something that we necessarily tested, but I think um, I'll just repeat much many of the prescriptions that have been offered by others. And it's really, it's just being more open-minded and more willing to listen as opposed to talking. Um, you know, all too often, and you see it just on your, your television talk shows. I mean, people talk over each other. They don't take time to listen. So uh, civility, allowing a person to express and, and respecting as well their point of view, um, but equally having the opportunity to share your point of view and giving them an opportunity to listen as well. I mean, the reality is at the end of the day, there's, and again, it's, it's, it's an adage, but there are more common bonds than things that separate us as Americans. And it's really just cutting through all of the, the partisan talk and getting to those core issues. Yeah. And, and one of the important points is we talk a lot about purpose and a lot about business leading from the front here. It's important to note that turning down the temperature, if you will, um, requires a couple things. Political capital in Washington, D.C., as well as in the states and in communities, really rely on three things. Number one, it's jobs. Good paying local jobs that allow families to stay together and prosper and have that next generation be better than the, the one previous. Number two is economic stability. The number one fear during COVID is not getting COVID. It's about losing your job. So if business can, can, can look at employee bases as well as stock prices, as well as shareholder earnings and kind of get to a balance that shows that they're invested in the communities that they serve, um, it could go a long way to continue to strengthen and build and fortify that foundation of trust. So jobs, economic, economic opportunity. And then the third, which is really important is that you know, it represents businesses representing kind of and tying into mutually shared values. So when we, of the community, so when we look at purpose and we look at the efforts business takes, you know, some business it's in their DNA to really engage on social and societal issues, right? In their DNA, they have the license to lead from that. But if they don't have the license to lead from that, they need to then rely on the issues that are core to their nature and their purpose. You know, I'm working with a client uh, right now who's like, well, we don't really necessarily have the license to engage on racial injustice or, or criminal justice reform. And they were like, well, is job creation and local economic development a purpose? Absolutely it is. So you, business can build trust and turn down the temperature, right? By bringing to bear storylines and messaging that serve the community as a whole, not just a partisan play to achieve a political objective. So I think actions, like we said in here, speak louder than words, um, but those actions build a lot of trust. So you, I think you have to be careful than measure on what initiatives are undertaken to not just build trust, but achieve your objectives because, because the country is split right now. Um, I know guys, well, I think we have originally scheduled for 45 minutes. We have many questions. If you guys are able to stick for a couple few more minutes on some questions. I did, would love to just keep running through a few of these um, for the folks that um, for folks that have to jump off at the 45 minute mark. Thanks for joining, but we'll, we'll stay on for a few more minutes just to get a couple more questions in because there's just a lot of interest here. And for anyone who's dropping off, we will um, we'll have a recording and also share um, the presentation uh, with folks um, uh, in the next day or two after this meeting. Uh, I'll just go for a few more. Paul asked, um, have you looked more deeply at the perception of corporate boards and company CEOs about how they view their duty of care uh, to shareholders or society at large? How does the quote unquote stakeholder capitalism uh, idea fit into this discussion? So we, we have, um, and we have every year we have an investor trust um, deck that comes out, it comes out in the fall. Um, this last version um, is available on our website. Um, just go to edelman.com and you'll find it there. But what we found with this most recent survey, it's very much what you're hearing from, whether it's the business roundtable, whether it's Larry Fink's um, annual letter to shareholders, it's, it's, it's noting that shareholders are more than, more than just those that own stock within a company. It's a big, um, a very much around ESG, very much around CSR, whereas leaders and corporate boards 
need to be much more diverse. They need to be representing the shareholders, the customers, and most importantly, the employees. I mean, that, that is really the core set that they need to be looking out for as they steer the company. Um, so much more emphasis on boardrooms these days, ensuring that they're the right mix of leadership and giving them much greater responsibility in the overall direction of the company. This is just a, uh, just a um, technical point, I guess, about your studies if they're available. Mark asked to see the website list trust barometers going back to 2012, but there's older ones. Do you guys have, are those available on, on the website somewhere in terms of going back on that data or no? They, they should be. Um, and if they're not, um, uh, we can track down. I'm not sure why they wouldn't be up there. Okay. Hosting. Data hosting. Yeah. You know, Aaron, you might've got to this before, I think, uh, but uh, Al asked, as long as government remains politically polarized, is it possible to improve trust people have in their government? I, mean, I think you were getting at this maybe from a, how do you, you actually address some of the economic issues that might restore trust here a little bit, but like, what is your view on that? So I think diplomacy is a lost art in, on Capitol Hill, right? In order to achieve an objective and attain the votes required to have a bill passed in either the House or the Senate, unless you have a supermajority or a majority, um, it takes diplomacy, right? It takes the art of compromise between parties and between elected officials in order to achieve that. Now, oftentimes in the past, those deals are um, done behind closed doors and not open to the public. So the public sees legislation being passed and rules being made that oftentimes they are not part, don't feel like they are part of the process. It strikes me that in order for Congress to start building trust, they need to recognize the hyperpartisanship that's on. They have to admit they have a problem, number one, in terms of trust. And number two, we need to have party line breaks right? Not, not necessarily like political breaks where, you know, the media, the media free feeding, feeding frenzy begins, but in order to get a bill passed, there needs to be compromise. And that compromise needs to be done without fear of my next election, right? Because that's how voters are starting to see politics on Capitol Hill. They're not representing us. They are representing their own self-interests and their careers on Capitol Hill. Like if it, the body politic in the United States represents the people, transparency and leadership needs to come from the Hill and it needs to be able to show that legislators are, are practicing the art of diplomacy and compromise. You can't get everything when you wanna pass a bill. So what, what, what do you give and what do you get in terms of political capital for your party and your position where we can advance America forward? The federal government has been stalled on a lot of major issues because the art of compromises and diplomacy is missing on Capitol Hill. That's my, that's my point of view um, and I stand by it. And when I start looking at a lot of the issues that are happening, um, particularly under Trump, going back to Bush, when we're, when we're looking at the Obama administration uh, with healthcare in particular, I mean, executive orders have been used to break stalemates, to pass a legislative agenda, and the American public is like, well, wait a minute, when did the president have this much power? Where is Congress involved? I think there needs to be a reset on Capitol Hill where leaders look at the American public and look at their constituency and look at the people on the other side of the aisle and say, we've got to come to an agreement because it's the right thing for the country, not the right thing for my party. And I'll yield my soapbox. The You'll find a lot of sympathizers with your ears. Uh, your marks on this, on this will fix us. Um, uh, we'll wrap it with one more. I know we're going over time here. Um, and for all those who didn't get questions, you know, I hope maybe we can do this again. I'm sure there's a lot of folks um, that want to learn from, hear from you all, and we'll definitely share the presentation with everybody. Uh, Susie asked, it's just a more micro question again on sort of different segments. What about trust in schools? in school districts, school boards. Um, she's asking because the local control aspect of school governance in most communities is a nonpartisan elected leader. What's your, um, what's your um, reaction to that guys as we wrap this up? I mean, we didn't, we didn't survey that segment, but that's actually a good idea. And 
Mm -hmm. We'll keep these in mind for the next trust cut. Um, but I think that is very much a theme that we're pulling out of this, that increasingly politicians' leadership is trusted at the local level. And that mm -hmm. is certainly something that we pulled out of the trust barometer, that it's, it's people trust people that they know, um, people that they have relationships with. Um, so getting back to what one of your colleagues said earlier about all trust being local, um, the more that we can drill down there, the more that we can localize politics, um, I think the, uh, it would be better for all of us. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and in terms of the education, so we had a working group on doing an education sector cut, drilling down um, to colleges, high schools, public and private schools. Um, and that looks to be on the radar for future studies. Um, but we agree that is a gap in here. And that's something that um, we're going to do an education cut in the future. We just haven't had a chance to, to, to put lead on target for that one. Uh, with that, thanks guys for going uh, a little bit over here. Um, but this was fantastic. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Aaron, Sean, thanks for taking the time to join us. I know that, like I said at the outset, uh, this, this topic is tailor-made for the interests of, of the folks that are focused here on uh, Fix Us and trying to figure out how we are going to restore trust. Great. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for having us. And if we can never be of assistance, just go to edelman.com and you'll be able to track us down. Yeah. Take Thanks, care. guys. Thanks, uh, have Take a good care. rest of your day. A nice weekend. You Thank too. Bye-bye.